Good morning, and welcome to Extraordinarily Ordinary. I'm Danae, and this is the channel where we celebrate living ordinary lives in extraordinary ways. I am currently at my breakfast bar, enjoying my first few cups of coffee, and directly across the room from me is a sink full of dirty dishes, taunting me with the obligation to get them done. There's also a vacuum cleaner in my hallway at the ready to remind me that I also need to do the floors and some dusting today. It's a never ending cycle, isn't it? You may be wondering why I even brought those things up considering they're not in frame, but I had to bring them up because they're the hallmarks of living an ordinary life. I mean, not everything is polished 24 seven. Not everything is camera ready or, mm, I almost said a bad word. Reality TV. And that's because we don't have a production team. We don't have personal assistants. We don't have a housekeeping staff. It's just extraordinarily ordinary here. My husband and I make a combined total of just less than $63,000 a year. And while that is more than some and less than others, it's pretty average in our neck of the woods. So we do what we can with what we have. And what we've discovered is we actually do have everything we need to maintain our happiness. Could we use more money? Yeah, who couldn't? But the fact is, our lights are on, our water is running, our insurance is paid, and we have food on our table. I mean, we have food on our table. However, at nearly 50, I look back on my life and see all of those times where I was convinced that I couldn't be happy until I reached a finish line. There had to be a mansion. There had to be a fancy car. There had to be a this, a that, a condition upon condition before I allowed myself to say, hey, life is pretty damn good. And frankly, right now, it's pretty damn good. In spite of the fact that now I'm middle-aged, morbidly obese, and there's no mansion. There's no fancy car. But there's happiness. And that's because I abandoned the American dream, or at least the illusion of what I believe the American dream to be. I no longer want to be greater than anyone else. I no longer want to prove my worth. I no longer have an attachment to how great I could be if only I could A, B, C, or D. It's been unconditionalized because the fact is that I am and you are and we are collectively great exactly where we are, exactly who we are right now. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past, what I've done in the past. I've been the drunk girl. I've been the one who's been asked to leave. I've made a fool of myself more times than, well, let's just say, I've definitely made a fool of myself. But isn't that what life is? The learning experience, the evolution, the changes that we go through. And then when we finally reach the points where we look back and we're unaffected, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter how low we've fallen. It only matters that we pick ourselves up, that we learn the lessons, that we take ownership of those lessons. There is no, for lack of a better word, sinlessness sitting at this breakfast counter. But just so we're clear, I only use the term sin because of its ubiquitous context. Um, it's a word when utilized that people understand indicates falling short, missing the mark, or ooh, betraying ourselves. I am not a religious person. However, 
I am incredibly spiritual. And I am not here to preach to anyone. That's not the goal. That's not the objective of um, Extraordinarily Ordinary. Actually, it's about moving beyond those concepts. It's actually about, you know, reveling in what life is and not what it could be. It's about being perfectly whole right now and working with the tools that we have at our disposal to create the lives that we want and no longer putting that off. Do you want conditionalized happiness? A laundry list of things that have to be achieved before you can experience joy, self-appreciation, fulfillment? That's not what I want, not anymore. I used to, but those are certainly not my goals of today. And speaking of today, what I would like to discuss with you is letting go of balloons and the principle of judge not lest ye be judged. Don't worry, this is not going to be a religious sermon. Like I said, I am not religious, but I am deeply spiritual. And I think that an examination of this tenet could really be eye-opening for a lot of people. It came to me as an epiphany as I was driving in my car, getting ready to experience a modicum of road frustration, not rage. I never get to that point, but I was a little annoyed. And then the epiphany struck, and I can't wait to share it with you because it was incredible incredibly eye-opening for me. So give me just a few minutes to get ready and I'll be back. Okay, I'm back. And I want to begin with a quick disclaimer that I am not a counselor a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist. I am no one credentialed in the field of mental health. So if you are suffering with issues related to mental health, I strongly suggest that you seek the guidance of an experienced professional. And with that out of the way, let's commence with today's discussion on letting go of balloons and the principle of judge not lest ye be judged. Now, I know you may be thinking, what on earth is this woman talking about um, letting go of balloons? Well, it's a method of letting go of guilt and shame and embarrassment, any of the chains or excuses that we utilize to tell ourselves or reinforce our beliefs that we are not good enough and we are not worthy. And it came to me over the course of time because one of the first things that happens when you discuss anything about your past, especially the things that are holding you back, is people will always say, well, just let it go, just let it go. And I didn't know how because my mind was trained and in the habit of dwelling it was the carousel. And once I hopped upon my guilt horse, my shame horse, my embarrassment horse, I could very easily take that ride, go round and round and spiral into those places of unworthiness. It was incredibly self-defeating and it held me back for a very long time, especially from experiencing my own gifts, my own happiness, my own contentment, learning to appreciate my experiences as opposed to judging them. And there's where we see we're going to get into judgment just a little later on. So anyway, letting go of balloons is, like I said, a technique for alleviating the shame and guilt and embarrassment that we carry. I mean, I have experiences from the past upon which I would dwell 
and just feel demeaned. And that's because I had compromised myself or I had made a colossal fool of myself. And I don't know if you in particular know, but during relationships in my early teens and 20s, I was an adolescent idiot. I knew nothing. And it was all very soap opera-like and very drama-filled and very ridiculous. Well, ridiculous if I look at it from this perspective. But the fact of the matter is, I didn't know any better at the time. So how could I have done better if I didn't know better? Yeah, okay, I digress. Getting back to letting go of balloons. One of the easiest ways to retrain your brain and let go of all of those negative emotions that keep us bogged down in unworthiness is to imagine when a thought, a feeling of guilt, embarrassment, or shame pops into your head, imagine it's a balloon. And imagine that balloon is something you're holding in your hand, which is really, metaphorically speaking, not far from the very language that we use. We say, hold a grudge, hold on to shame, hold on to guilt, hold on to embarrassment. We're coming back to those three because they're primarily the ones that really bind us down. So imagine that is a balloon floating over your head. And what you do is that guilt, whatever it represents, you look at it, you know what it is, you acknowledge that it's there, and then you deliberately, mentally release that balloon, sending it to the universe, sending it to your God, whatever deity it is. Um, and if you're an atheist or you know, non-religious agnostic. Send it to nature. Nature knows how to recycle everything that it has created. And guilt, shame, and embarrassment are just a few of those things. Drop in the bucket of the things that the universe has created, that nature has created, that God has created. And frankly, if you have no use for guilt, or shame, or embarrassment, then you need to send it away where it can be recycled, perhaps into something far more beautiful. Let's not forget, crops, flowers, everything that grows is fertilized with shit. So give the shit back to nature. Let nature cultivate it. Let nature turn it into something beautiful. And the moment we let go of that shit, we have the opportunity to create something more beautiful, or at least to perceive something more beautiful. It does take some time, it takes vigilance, and it does take practice, because you have to be very aware of what's going on with your thoughts. Our brains are just as habitual as we are as creatures. We like to think that one may be separated from the other, but the fact is, it's the habit of our brain that controls or dictates the habits that we perform with our bodies. So we have to create the interruption, the interruption of the habit. And that's the first key is interrupting the habit. I don't know about you and your life experiences, but I do know in mine, in my youth, I made a colossal fool of myself because I was so naive. And in a certain respect, there is a blamelessness that goes along with that because I had so many misconceptions about love, about sexuality and sex itself, about how the world worked. And I also had a great number of insecurities that made me hungry and desperate or desperately hungry to fit in, to find a way 
to create these experiences that seem so normal in everyone else's lives for myself. And I didn't know how. And desperation stinks. I didn't know that until much older, but I digress. Suffice it to say, my insecurities would lead to some humiliating and demeaning experiences that would ultimately ripple through my psyche and affect my life experience for decades. Literally, decades. So one day in August of 2021, I was sitting on the back porch drinking a cup of coffee when my habitual brain wanted to prompt me to get back on the carousel and re-experience a negative circumstance in my life along with the negative emotions that accompany it. And in that moment, I knew I had to bring it to an end. I had to put it to a stop. I didn't know how. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I did stop in my tracks. I stopped the thought and said, I must do something. And by some means of inspiration, the concept of a balloon came to mind. It popped into my head. Initially, I didn't know what it meant. I wasn't sure what balloon had anything to do with my objective. However, the balloon, the inspiration, it stopped me from hopping onto the carousel. And in that moment, I finally felt empowered. In that moment, I finally realized, oh my gosh, I am actively participating in the carousel ride. I am actively participating in the spiral. I am actively participating in creating unworthiness. And in that moment, I realized there was something I could do. I imagined that negative circumstance and the negative emotions that I was tempted to re-experience hovering in that balloon, encapsulated in that balloon over my head. And I acknowledged the experience, I acknowledged the emotion, and I deliberately told myself I no longer needed it. I also told the universe, I don't know what to do with this, so I release it to you. And in my mind, I deliberately opened my hand. There's a very active role that is played in practicing this method, but it is so effective. From the moment I released that first balloon, I felt relief. I felt a sense of accomplishment. I felt a sense of growth. And I felt, as small as it may have been, a sense of appreciation for the fact that I was able to recognize what was about to happen to me should I have hopped on that carousel and having the wherewithal to put it to a stop. So within the first couple of weeks of releasing that first balloon, I was releasing balloons all day every day. Um, anything that would pop into my head that made me the least bit uncomfortable, especially if it was related to the past, coming into my present, the balloon was there and I was letting it go. It was a ritual for me. I needed something that was very active. I needed something that was cathartic. I needed to be able to acknowledge the experience that was coming through. I needed to be able to acknowledge the emotions that accompanied that experience. And I needed to very deliberately and fully release it, release them. And it's been an amazing, enlightening, relieving life since then. Please take note.
notes of the following. Releasing the balloons, this method does come with a huge level of responsibility. Um, and that is any responsibility that we have when it comes to dictating our own thoughts. Um, mastering our own thoughts is something that takes practice. Um, recognizing when we are about to habitually take ourselves to a negative emotional space and relive a negative emotional experience to keep us repeating the same old, same old, producing the same old, that has to be, you have to be vigilant. You have to be vigilant in this practice. It's not exhausting, really, because it does turn into something fun. It turns into something that you can create as a game, but it is incredibly effective. And I recommend that you try it. The important thing is, is to remain vigilant to keep yourself aware of your habits, to acknowledge them, whatever they may be. Because the more of us that are out there living in peace and processing through our shit, the happier we all will be, the kinder we all will be, the more compassionate we all will be. And now I would like to discuss the tenet of judge not lest ye be judged. I know this principle is predominantly associated with the Christian faith and perhaps this tenet exists in other religions as well. Um, I am not aware of those associations. However, I do want to say that I am presenting this principle from merely a spiritual perspective. Because to me, the tenet of judge not lest ye be judged is actually more of a universal law. And I say that because regardless of your faith, if you judge something, you will be affected by it. And you may not believe me yet, but let me explain. So I was driving to work the other day and I was on the verge of experiencing a moment of road annoyance. Road rage is beyond my emotional spectrum, but I wasn't late. I was fully prepared for my day and there was nothing to prevent me from just enjoying my commute to work. However, the individual in front of me was driving at what I believed to be a glacial pace, and I judged them. I judged the circumstance, and I judged that person for driving so very slowly. And all of a sudden, I was annoyed, and I realized I was annoyed, and I thought, why? Why are you annoyed? You're not late you're fully prepared, and this is a beautiful day. And it occurred to me, it was because I had judged the circumstance and I had judged the person in front of me as annoying. Well, from that experience, the tiny seed was planted in my brain. I judged, and that seed germinated and took root in the most amazing way and led me to the realization that my experience, my annoyance, was the direct result of my judgment. I know that we think that judge not lest ye be judged is this boomerang concept that we throw judgment out at other people and other things. And then, you know, at some point in life, that'll come back around to us and we'll be held accountable to the same standard and judged thereby. However, I'm here to tell you, there is no waiting period. Judgment and the effects thereof are immediate. 
if you think about it. Think about someone not in particular or someone in particular and think of them what you will. Let's say there's a very beautiful woman at the checkout counter and she is decked out, full makeup, short skirt, gorgeous high heels, and yet she represents something to you that is less savory than just a human being going about their shopping. And we say, what a slut. Ooh. Immediately upon the thought, upon the utterance of that judgment, we create an entire concept in our minds. We have the synapses that go along with that concept and we have a physiological and emotional response to the judgment that we have just made. We think we put our judgments off onto other people and we think we wait for them to come back around. But the fact is, the effects of judgment are immediate. You can try it with anything. And if nothing else, you have perhaps, like me, experienced it by judging my own self, by judging myself, by judging my past, by judging the things I did out of naivety or ignorance or just plain youthful stupidity. I judged those things and they put me on a carousel to guilt and shame and embarrassment. We can practice judgment on ourselves all day long, and many of us do. And we know that the effects of those judgments are immediate because we experience them. We spiral, we go into unworthiness, and we experience the negative emotions. Well, we're not immune to those same emotions when we believe we are casting judgment upon other people. I encourage you to test the theory. I encourage you to try it out for yourself because if you're paying attention, you'll realize that it's happening in the very moment that the judgment occurs. That epiphany has changed my life. It's changed my outlook and that happened only a couple of days ago. So there's something to be said and something to contemplate. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it was informative and I hope you'll give it a little bit of thought. If you like, let me know in the comments below what your experiences have been with judgment, with the carousel, and letting go of balloons. Until next time, be kind, be fabulous, and enjoy the experience of life.